Around the world, our cities face common threats, such as climate change, natural hazards, or global pandemics. Action must be taken, but in a way that's suitable for each country, each city, and its people. There is no single solution. Society is complex, circumstances differ, and what applies to one country may not suit another. We explore the challenges that we are facing globally and how we translate that into action at a local level. In episode one, we explored the concepts of risk, uncertainty, and resilience. Today, we'll hear from people responsible for policy development, local government, and city infrastructure. We've chosen to look at three cities, Edmonton, Durban, and Christchurch. We'll understand how they have to make important decisions for the people they represent and adapt global or national policy to suit their community. The assumption in defining risk in the Global North is that there is infrastructure to be impacted. The challenge in the Global South is we lack that infrastructure. We have seen the brunt of climate change and impacts to our resiliency faster than other parts of the world. We then convene a panel of infrastructure and engineering experts from around the world to learn from their perspectives and experiences. The resilience in a local context should be one that takes account of the affordability in the country and the setting that it's in. My name is Don Iveson. Uh, I am the mayor of the city of Edmonton. Uh, people have been living here for thousands and thousands of years, uh, and it continues to be the crossroads of many cultures and civilizations trying to make life better for each other. So Edmonton has been on and off the fastest growing city in Canada, and so much of what's driven that growth in uh, my lifetime has been the resource economy and oil and gas here in Northern Alberta. We've known that resource wealth was literally non-renewable and wasn't going to last forever. So we've been working to diversify the economy and the economic base here for, for decades. The other thing about this place is the northernmost major Canadian city. We have seen the brunt of climate change and impacts to our resiliency faster than other parts of the world and other parts of the country. So we've seen much more severe weather, devastating wildfires up in Fort McMurray about five years ago. We've seen devastating floods in Calgary, and so Alberta's been hit very, very hard. Around the world we are facing really globally significant threats. We've all just experienced the pandemic, but there is a real need to think about how we need to implement action at a local level, because all of our local situations are very different. The general trends that we're all experiencing are, are the same because we all live on the same planet. But the way we understand those changes, the way we respond to them are, are quite different. And so this is one of the biggest challenges in the city. We've got a very high level of informality, just under 600 informal settlements, for whom there is no access to standard infrastructure. Um, and that is probably one of the biggest challenges that, that we are facing in creating resilience, is acknowledging that on the African continent, the dynamic of informality means that people are building their own cities within cities. And those cities do not have the traditional form of infrastructure that we have, which in itself creates a risk. We saw that uh, during the response to the COVID pandemic, where the correct and appropriate advice of national government was to wash your hands. But how do you wash your hands if you do not have access to running water? And so that is probably one of the biggest challenges is the lack of, of infrastructure. In less developed countries, it's important to consider what resources can be made available to support infrastructure development. But taking appropriate action isn't just about providing funding and transferring expertise from one place to another. The recent and tragic Grenfell fire in the United Kingdom showed that to ensure safe outcomes for communities, it's equally important to ensure that governance keeps pace with development. In 2017, I was asked to conduct an independent review by government looking at how the regulatory system had failed. In my review, I referred to this notion of a race to the bottom. And in part, that relates back to uh, an inadequate regulatory system that didn't hold people to account. And so because people knew they could get away with things, they did, 
what it what it's also about for me is uh, holding people to account for delivering the right outcome. And in the case of of the construction industry, particularly in the residential sector, what I talked about a lot was it's not sufficient to just go into a building and do your bit and then walk away and hope someone else is going to fix the other things, whatever they may be. Someone has to have responsibility for delivering buildings that are safe for people to live in. Regulatory systems are a really important part of the framework for managing safety, whether that's infrastructure, chemical processes, you and I driving on the road, whatever it is, the regulatory framework is really important. It gets eroded sometimes for a whole variety of reasons. One of those can be that the level of enforcement is not sufficient to persuade people that they need to comply, or the penalties for failing to comply are so low that it doesn't provide a deterrent in the system. In other words, it's worth chancing it because if that's all I've got to pay as a result of getting found out, I'll chance it. And you can imagine in a situation where the potential gain from taking that chance is much higher than the penalty, that becomes a real issue because people do game the system. So investing in infrastructure requires understanding the exposure to risk and then who owns that risk. And if we don't allocate that clearly, then we can end up with a very fragmented system. So if we think about risk in relation to infrastructure in the city of Durban, probably the largest risk is the lack of infrastructure. I think this is one of the big differences between the Global North and the Global South. The assumption in defining risk in the Global North is that there is infrastructure to be impacted. The challenge in the Global South is we lack that infrastructure. So climate change is a good example of a global threat. The city of Christchurch, Edmonton and Durban all need to respond in a different way. They have different geographies, different climates, different economies and different capacities to respond. There's no silver bullet for climate change. We've got to have a, a whole lot of ways in which we reduce the inefficiency in our use of energy. I think we probably need to move away from uh, such a global economy uh, where we depend on components being uh, transported halfway across the world in our manufacturing. Uh, we need to perhaps be more locally self-sufficient on a national scale and even in a more local scale. Uh, that will lead to greater resilience and also probably a greater economy and energy use. So my name's Tom Ravikarnak and I've worked in climate change for nearly 20 years. In creating the emerging future, one of the challenges we have is that there are so many moving pieces that evolve together. We know that we need to have a low carbon future. We know that will lead to changes in our lives. We know it will lead to changes in all elements of how we live our lives. But those elements will change alongside evolving values in society, evolving patterns of behavior, and the things that we accept as we understand what that future is gonna look like. So that means not that they don't travel, but that the idea of how travel integrates into your life changes. So if you just take the world today, try to change one piece, and then draw a direct line to a future, you can say flying less means a less rich world. If you look at how the other pieces integrate that as well, you can say, Flying less could actually mean a richer world because you don't just disappear off for a week and have a surface level experience of a different part of the world. You go for longer, you integrate, you work there. So you still see the world, but it's different. So we know that there are areas of our city where we're built for one in 10 or one in 50 year flooding. And uh, those systems have been overwhelmed in some case more than once. And so we know we need to uh, harden those areas uh, to flooding and introduce dry ponds that can fill up when the systems are overwhelmed and so on and so forth. And that there's a cost to doing that. And by the way, they were designed for one in 50, you know, 30 or 40 years ago. and. That used to be two inches of rain in an hour, now it's two and a half. So you got an extra half inch of water times the surface area of a neighborhood that you got to deal with, on top of the fact that uh, the new standard would be one in 100. 
And is one in 100 the right standard? Because you could harden it to one in a thousand, but that's going to cost exponentially more money. So what you actually have to do is back up and say, what are the acceptable losses that government through disaster relief is prepared to undertake? And then what is a fair cost for rate payers at the municipal level? And there's actually a solution for that. Ultimately, it's values-based and it requires a level of collaboration between the insurance industry, engineering decision makers, and senior orders of government to decide how much exposure do they want to have long-term to these liabilities. But if you have all those people talking to each other about a complex question like this, you can actually find a, at least a best guess, a technically driven answer. We're going to spend $1.6 billion dollars on flood mitigation efforts. We used to call them flood prevention efforts here in Edmonton, and we realized that's setting the expectations inappropriately high, because we know it's still gonna flood one in every 100 years with the storms of today. Being able to make the case for that, ideally with academic support, uh, industry support, and intergovernmental agreement, those are the kinds of things we need to solve for now of making the right-sized investment on the front end to support resiliency. So I think that when we are looking at sea level rise, the hardest part is for the areas that are already developed. So when you've got considerable development along your coastline, then it does require a much more gentle approach because in the future, those areas are not going to be uh, lived in. They're not going to be. But that doesn't mean now and it doesn't mean that there isn't a way out that can be planned for the future. So let me use um, a phrase which people don't like, and that is managed retreat. Managed retreat simply is a process whereby you retreat from an area of vulnerability, in this case, the coastline. In Christchurch, after the earthquakes, we had unmanaged retreat. The government made decisions about areas that would not be redeveloped after the earthquakes. This retreat was in response to major earthquake damage, and the decisions were made quickly and reactively. Not all residents were happy to leave. There is a positive long-term legacy that is emerging for the city, but only after huge disruption and heartache. There are significant areas all along the Otakaro Aben River, and it has created actually an incredible legacy for the city because it's an area that is able to be utilised for uh, flood protection, you know, the restoration of wetlands, um, but also an incredible recreational asset for the whole city. Uh, so it, it's been a huge benefit. But the um, earthquake actually gave the government the financial uh, ability to only meet part of the cost because the insurers met the balance of the cost. So it was an unmanaged retreat, but actually financially viable for that reason. There are a range of resilience-oriented initiatives that have emerged over the past decade to help facilitate local action that is coupled with a global ambition for change, including the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, the Resilient Cities Network, and more recently, the City's Race to Resilience. Durban was involved in the 100 Resilient Cities program as a way of finding opportunities to better integrate the work it was doing in water management, biodiversity and climate change adaptation. So I think the important lessons for Durban from the 100 Resilient Cities experience was the importance of having the opportunity and resources and time to experiment around important ideas. And I think that, as with much of our climate change work, has really reinforced the fact that we need to see greater flexibility in government systems. The Sendai framework has a sort of a, a disaster risk reduction approach, but it also has the Build Back Better mantra. And international guidelines like the Sendai framework, they, they are very, very helpful for uh, both cities and, and, and national governments to respond to uh, a disaster and to think about all of those elements as they, uh, as they recover. But it has to be sense-checked against the reality that is faced in your own 
um, city or your own country, the, the environment may be quite different, the rules might be quite different, the extent of insurance cover might be quite different. So I think all of these elements feed into what is the best approach for your city, recognising that there are these international guidelines that are designed to assist, but not to lock you into a framework that you couldn't possibly deliver. And this is why it's really important to recognise that there is no one global solution for how, at a local level, we should be responding to that challenge. An earlier attempt to bring the globe together to act in response to this emerging challenge of climate change was the establishment of the Kyoto Protocol. The Kyoto Protocol was an international treaty signed in 1997. The signatories agreed to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. It was a top-down agreement that only bound industrialised countries to action. It set targets and penalties, but some key countries did not participate. Years later, the Paris Agreement was signed, which allowed countries to make pledges towards a global target. It has achieved wider commitment across both developed and developing countries. Now, the Paris Agreement is a very unusual type of international agreement. Previously, there's been a very unhappy history of trying to get the world to come together to agree to do big transformative things that fundamentally change their economies over decades. The reason for that is because we don't know what that future is gonna look like. So they come together, and this, is, this was true, for example, of the Kyoto Protocol. Countries come together and try to agree a shared emissions reduction pathway that they would all take that is based on fairness, based on who's capable of doing what, and then they would all go back to their national legislatures and try to implement that in national law. But what we found over multiple attempts was that even if something could be agreed at the international level, and it couldn't always, far from it, it was almost never implemented at the national level. Even when we look at this from a local perspective, there are formal networks in which we operate. For example, the rules and regulation that guide how we make decisions. But within that, there is an informal network of how we go about our day-to-day -day jobs, which can influence how people come along with us and how we're able to try and push forward changes. This idea of resilience was introduced as this process of experimentation that wasn't part of, of the mainstream. What has happened is that opened up the opportunity for us to talk to residents of Durban in a way that one generally can't in formal city processes, which are time bound and structured. So I think resilience requires a combination not only of using the formal structured processes of government, but also acknowledging that the informal links within government provide us with an important opportunity for flexibility and experimentation, which is a key part of moving the resilience agenda forward. So to move towards a more prepared situation, we need to start thinking ahead around what our future might look like and where we might find ourselves and what relationships both within and across our organisations, we need to have to help facilitate that. It's really important to have local relationships, but also this confidence in understanding the local context so that when things do happen and decisions need to be made, we can look to global guidelines, but understand how to translate them into what's going to work at the local level. Turning to more general ethics, I, I think the biggest thing we've got to be concerned about is the um, international ethics and the huge inequalities, not only within countries, but between countries. So I think there's actually just a tremendous amount of emotional labor necessary to, um, to come to terms personally and collectively with what resilience really would demand of us. And yet by doing it, that is how we build resilience. We've had decades of warning about um, the climate crisis and at least years of warning about the biodiversity crisis. And we need to uh, tackle both of those while also still lifting another 4 billion people out of total deprivation and poverty. Um, but that seems like a fun project for the 21st century, to me anyway. For this episode, my colleagues and I went to find people who have different expertise and different perspectives to see how the content of this episode resonated with them.
I totally agree that even though we're facing global problems that affects everyone on the planet, the solution around it should be localized and should vary based on country or even a city's context. With these localized solutions, the positive impact that you create cascades outside your country or your city that you're implementing this on. There were comments around the global north and the global south. It occurred to me that kind of the, the Arab world or at least the Arabian Gulf cities that I live and work in are kind of somewhere in between. They do have the infrastructure generally that's in the global north. However, it's been built very quickly and without, very importantly, without the robust regulatory system and the monitoring of that. There has been historically a wholesale exporting of standards in the north uh, to countries of the south. The resilience in a local context should be one that takes account of the, the conditions, the aspirations, the affordability in the country and the setting that it's in. When we deal with climate uh, resilience, I think we, we may want to have a system thinking. We may want to think about is the engineering solutions, how to go hand in hand with the nature-based solutions. For small islands, of which there are hundreds or thousands containing millions of people, many of these countries have no redundancy. They would have one airport, one referral hospital, one major power plant, and they're isolated. One event, one hurricane, or one earthquake could envelop the whole of the country. They require higher standards than large metropolitan wealthy countries. And this is not clearly recognized internationally. The, the hardest um, challenges to fix are the existing ones, the existing infrastructure. And that's the challenge we have in many of the Gulf cities when it comes to um, infrastructure related to stormwater management, sea level rise, higher temperatures, etc. When you've got considerable development along your coastline, then it does require a much more uh, gentle approach. Things change with time. So there is that temporal aspect as well that we have to consider with resilience. Very hard balancing act, but it's not impossible, but it is amount of how far do we want to take it? It does depend what domain you're in, okay? Some are lagging more than others. There is no clear answer. It is a part of a, a risk profile. It's part of your culture because what's accepted in one demographic in one country may not be acceptable in another. So that comes back to your local flavours and the timing of it. Using the Sendai framework, we started to change the conversation about imagining risk, historical, but also future. We started to look at how we organise ourselves to manage our exposures. International guidelines like the Sendai framework, they are very helpful for both cities and, and, and national governments to respond to a disaster. Let's use events to be a trigger for investment. And then that last one, that last pillar of Sendai, which I think sometimes gets um, forgotten, and that's about learning the lessons of prior disasters to incorporate in our future settings. And, and that's what we sort of really focus on here. And that drives a lot of our investment in resilient infrastructure is understanding how it has performed historically and what it needs to look like into the future. A quality of infrastructure is that it has very long life. That's a particular um, feature of th this whole range of issues that we face in infrastructure because we are committing future generations to a legacy which we have limited knowledge of what the future will hold, but they will inherit the decisions that we make now. And resilience in an unknown future has to have a quality which is blind to the threats that are faced and capable of dealing with a huge range of future shocks to the system. We have explored action at a local level and what it requires of wider policy, standards and professional practice. We focused on three locations, but the solutions will be different for each of the thousands of cities around the world. In our next episode, we will continue this theme, but explore the phenomenon of disasters being used as an opportunity for change.